Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. I was the white motorcycle policeman. Hello, operators, whether you're tier one or tier none, you're welcome here. I'd like you to grab a pen and a paper because, in my humble opinion, the next 45 minutes to an hour are going to be the most invaluable time we spend. You know, my goal is to bring you more information, more data, things that you can use. I'm excited. As you can see, that our guest there is Mr. Jonathan Bernstein. Wave, Jonathan. Let everybody know you're here. I'm here. I'm going to do a long-winded introduction. I'm never okay. lost for words, but I'm excited to have Mr. Bernstein with us today. A couple things. Good example. I'm going to do a bad example. Bad example. School shooting, mass shooting, uh, gun violations, horrific events happen. What's the gun industry do? Crickets, people. I hear nothing from them. The largest Second Amendment group comes out and makes a statement that, in my opinion, is usually insensitive to those that have suffered this horrific event, whatever it may be. And then they make another statement and they immediately turn to fundraising. They're two smaller groups who do make powerful messages who I think are on the right track, but they're not getting out there. Only people who see that are people who've joined those two other groups. Not doing well. Uh, I understand some of the gun makers say, well, it wasn't my gun that was used. Who does a good job of crisis management? My opinion, airlines do a great job of crisis management. Airplane disaster, airplane crash, what happens? Front and center comes the highest ranking person with the company, CEO. And what do they do? They address the human side first. Our hearts go out with the families of our passengers and our crew. They established a rapport immediately with that. We're making every effort to bring those family members who wish to, to join us at ABC or crash site or wherever the event happened. And then they express that their sincere interest and that they've already are already cooperating with authorities. We have the FAA full access to records. NTSB, National Tra Transportation Safety Board, is on site. They have full access to our records and our mechanics and everything available to them. It's very powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. Gun industry, we don't do that. Uh, our lobbying groups, what do they do? They're going after the laws that are being made. I, I think that's a mistake. I think you have to get ahead of this. Mr. Bernstein, an expert on this, get ahead of this to win the hearts and minds of people. We can't make everybody a gun lover, and that shouldn't be our intention. We can probably, and I think Mr. Bernstein agree, move them from a negative to at least a neutral. So the, goal, the, the goal is always to, you've always got three audiences, and first of all, you're on the right track. They should hire you as a spokesperson because you, you, you want to come across with compassion, confidence, and competence. And if you don't have compassion first for the feelings of those affected, whether you agree with them or not, nobody's going to listen to you. And you're dealing with three groups. You're dealing with the critics who will never agree with you, the extreme critics, and that isn't the audience. And then certainly you're talking to your supporters and your allies who might speak up to support you. But the vast battle is for the hearts and minds of the fence sitters. And I, what you're saying accurately is the fence sitters are not being addressed here. And so you're losing a lot of potential supporters. And you want the fence sitters to ideally become supporters. But what you don't want them to do is become critics. And if you don't deal with them properly, that's what will happen. They will default to becoming critics. And you, you, you can't just spite the battle inside the Beltway in Washington. You've got to win the hearts and minds of the people who might be key voters at the right time for you uh, in the meantime. Outstanding. I, I finally feel like I accomplished it. I got one right. If Mr. Bernstein, Jonathan, looks familiar to you, you might have seen him. Let me think. Let's see. CNBC, uh, published in Forbes magazine. Where else might our audience have seen you? Most major media internationally. We, we probably give an interview a week to traditional media. Outstanding. And I really want to thank you for coming to our small niche market where people <laughs> by the thousands run to our podcast and immediately wonder why and how they got here. Well, I'm a longtime gun owner. I've, I've been involved with, with gun programs since I was 14, 15 years old in NRA programs. I was a hunter and shooter as a teenager living as a dependent in South Korea. In the 60s, I was in the Army, of course. I had a bit of exposure there. I was a member of a German shooting club and competed and I competed in friendly competitions locally until just a few years ago with with two pistols and I also shot uh, did a lot of work with my shotgun so I've given those away to my son now because my upper back can't take it anymore but I've always had a long time association with safe ownership of weapons well I love that phrase safe ownership of weapons uh, 
as you know, I'm involved with the SHOT Show every year, the largest wholesale gun convention in the country. Uh, I did an unofficial survey. I love surveys. I like those if they uh, support, <laughs> support my beliefs. No, <laughs> just kidding. I asked for the last two years, because of election cycles, Second Amendment gun ownership gets beaten to death. Uh, and with all the relevant laws and things that are passing, I asked two things when people walk by the booth in the morning and evening afterwards after the, if the show floor is closed. Who is your crisis management consultant? And do you have a full-time lobbyist? And I get that deer in the headlight look. They have no idea what I'm talking about. And and I get concerned because I like the AR-15 platform. I visit factories all the time, and I see their millions of dollars worth of equipment, and I don't understand why they're not as concerned as I am. If I make AR-15s and a light bulb comes on and I realize that I can't easily convert these machines to make heart valves, and I call Jonathan Bernstein. We're going to provide your information all through the show in a tagline at the bottom. But if I have that awakening moment where I say, where am I? I need something. And I call you. You've got a list of things that for fun and for free on your website. But you've also got some things that you do for clients. Can you take me through that step by step? Sure. There's a four-part process uh, to crisis preparedness as opposed to break, as breaking crisis short circuits this process. But if you want to get ready in advance for managing any kind of issue, first you do what we call a vulnerability audit. You look at where anybody could pick apart anything you're saying or doing, and do you have a good answer for that? And you know, where are you? Do you do that, do you do that in person or can you do it remotely? It, it can be done remotely. It it's, depends on how many people need to be spoken with and whether sometimes an audit requires a physical presence. Sometimes they need to walk through a factory and point out things that are Anybody, if you showed the, if you, I, if, with the mind of a reporter, which I used to be, I was an investigative journalist in Washington, D.C. after I got out of the service. So I, I'm a reporter, but I'm working on my client's side and I'm looking around and saying, OK, if I saw that as a reporter for any network you want to name, I would be wondering what that was for. You know, and so we do an audit first and every any. We're looking at HR, we're looking at manufacturing, we're looking at legal, we're looking at PR, looking for red flags we've identified in 30 years of doing this. And once we've identified those, we try to mitigate them as much as we can and move on to actually creating a plan, training people on how to use the plan, including media training. And that's all before you actually launch any kind of crisis communications and, program. And and you've got a lot of experience with attorneys, right? You work hand in glove with attorneys. Yeah, about 50% of the time we're, we're directly co contracted to counsel on litigation-related matters to keep our work as privileged as possible. It's not the same level of privilege as attorney-client, but it's high enough level that in the four or five times people have tried to get information from me or get me to be deposed, um, they've not succeeded. At the same time, my contract specifically says that if I am deposed, they will pay my fee. <laughs> so. Because people don't, I, I don't think they realize how critical this is when something bad happens. Because if something bad happens, how fast? That fast. Right. Court of pu public court of public opinion is real time, instant these days with the internet. Court of law could go on for years and years and years. But in the meantime, the court of public opinion is an I'm not sure you or I would consider this to be any difference, but the lawyers, there's a difference between influencing the jury, jury pool, which they are not allowed to do according to legal ethics, and educating the jury pool, which they are allowed to do. So we help them educate the jury pool, which does make a difference on both jurists, the, you know, the, the, the uh, judges, and on potential jury members. Do you hear that? That's that would you say that again you're not there to answer they're their not questions. there to answer their questions you're there to deliver your messages